Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Riverline. We thank you for joining us here this morning for worship. If this is your first time visiting with us, we welcome you and we're glad you're watching them with us. All those who are unable to be with us on, we welcome those who are watching us virtually. The announcements we have in our bulletin, I'm just going to highlight a few. Uh, we'd like to welcome Anita Stone Street as our pianist this morning. Also, the Bible study is going tonight with J uh, Jason Barnes is at 6, is in the cottage. There's a family night this Wednesday at 5.30 with Trunk or Treat will be next Wednesday. The Trunk or Treat is going to be from 5.30 to 7.30. The dinner will start with pizza at 5.30. From 6 to 6.20, the pumpkin devotion will be by Pastor Chris. The children will go to the sanctuary for that time, and that will give the members time enough to decorate their car trunks. 6.30 to 7.30 is going to be the Trunk or Treat with crafts and games, roasting marshmallows from the fire pit, and the children's costume contest, and the best decorated car trunk contest. That will be held on Wednesday, October the 25th. Also, there's going to be a chili bean soup luncheon next Sunday, so everyone make sure you come out for that. That'll be held right after the service. And the men's breakfast, will be held on Saturday, October the 21st at the Cracker Barrel in Cross Lanes. If you men would like to attend that, it starts at 8.30. Is there any other announcements? Pastor Chris. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, do you breathe once? There we go. Uh, first off, I want to say again, thank you uh, for all the ways that Riverlong has continued to express your love and support to me over the years. Uh, last week, and not only last week, but uh, every week. So I feel incredibly blessed, and that has, has always been the case. Um, two other brief things. There's information in the bulletin about the luncheon next week. I know they're meeting some volunteers, so if you're able to volunteer in any of those ways, please do, and thank you. And especially, I would like to challenge everyone to get one of the River Lawn shirts that are being made. There's an insert in the bulletin about that. You can order it through a link on the Facebook page. You can do it through the email blast we sent. We can send you a specific email. You can contact Joanna or me. There are lots of ways, some easy ways for us to, to help you get one of those. Uh, they're gonna be great shirts that look sharp. Most importantly, they're gonna support our youth being able to go to Columbia for our mission team this, this summer in June. So, and you know, that's, there's a lot of different dimensions to that, and I know they appreciate the, the support of, of Riverlong, their family. And you'll have a great shirt just so you should wear and let people know how much you love your church family. So we hope you'll do that. If you have questions about that, please let me know. Um, appreciate you supporting it. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Is there any other announcements that needs to be made? If not, please join me with prayer to worship. Would you climb the heights to view the promises of God. Stand in the house of God to give praise. Praise God. Praise the name of God. Sing to God, who is great and good and gracious. God has chosen us and claims our loyalty. God opens our eyes to see life's possibilities. Praise God for all the wonders of creation. Praise God for saving acts of mercy. Rejoice in the God of peace who welcomes us here. God is listening to our words and to our hearts. We will not turn away from God's invitation. We are here to celebrate with our host. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts for worship as we gather together and listen to the prelude prepared by Pam and Anita. Praise to God. Praise to the Lord.
that was beautiful. Would you please stand and join in singing the first hymn on page 33, Immortal, Evisible, God Only Wise. Also it'll be printed on the screen. <laughs> God, your repeated invitations to us has often fallen on deaf ears. Your promises are revealed before unseen eyes. Too often we have resisted your companionship and failed to grasp the peace you offer. We are anxious that, about many things and we allow our differences to divide us. Have compassion on us, amazing God, and vindicate us. Center us once again on Jesus Christ and on the peace you're eager to give us. Amen. Would you please join me in silently confessing your sins? Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. May the God of mercy, who forgives us of all sins, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Thanks be to God. You may be seated.
I got it. Good morning again, church. Let's turn to God's word this morning. Exodus chapter 16, and then John 6. We've been looking at these two chapters for the last couple weeks. This is the third and final week, as we have been considering the mystery of Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. So let us begin in the book of Exodus. The manna that foreshadowed ultimately Jesus in Exodus 16, beginning in verse 31. Hear the word of the Lord. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it 
for the generations to come so that they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the wilderness when I brought you out of Egypt. So Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it, then place it before the Lord to keep it for the generations to come. As the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put the manna with the tablets of the covenant law so that it might be preserved. The Israelites ate manna 40 years until they came to a land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. In John chapter 6, we continue and we begin in verse 51. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? As the Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. The word of the Lord. Would you please pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for our Savior. We thank you for the bread of heaven. We thank you that you alone nourish us to live in newness of life and life everlasting. So by your spirit, open our eyes and move our hearts to understand, receive, and respond in faith and love. And we pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. You are what you eat. Why is everyone laughing? And if you've read the sermon title, you're wondering whether I'm going to preach on the best kind of diet. You're disappointed. And even if I did, who would take my word for it? So this morning, I'm, I'm not so much interested in the advantages or disadvantages of a, a low-carb diet, though that is very useful. I'm concerned with a much more important kind of diet that we all have to deal with. 
In our passage for today, Jesus has managed to get our Jewish friends even madder than before. In fact, after what he says here, many of his disciples, followers, who'd been with him for a while, choose to leave, not come back. And so apparently you cannot measure the faithfulness of a ministry by its popularity. Jesus is proof in point, and sometimes some parts. But the fact that parts of the church really have fought each other over these words for centuries show that there is still a following, that these words are significant. Which words? Listen to that again. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, if you're like me, that sounds strange. Does it sound strange to you? It would have sounded even worse for the Jews listening. It would have been extra offensive to them because the law of Moses banned the drinking of blood whatsoever. And they're taking this very literally and are, say, it's very, very hard to even listen to. So how literal we take Christ's words have also been the reason for many denominations because of different interpretations of what we are actually doing when we partake of the Lord's Supper. And that debate over what goes on in the Lord's Supper goes back to the early church, but its real focal point was during the Reformation with people like Martin Luther and Ulrich Zing Zingli. Zwingli. So what they did agree on, though, there was something, was that their disagreement with the traditional Catholic view of what happens. But Luther no longer believed that the, the bread and the wine actually changed into the literal flesh and blood of Jesus in the Mass. However, he still held that Christ's physical body was somehow present in the supper because Jesus said it, so he must have meant it. So what has to be remembered is that Jesus, as he does often, uses metaphor. This is my body. And as much as I, I love Luther, when Christ said, I am the gate, although I'm sure he meant it, that it had incredible significance, I don't think anyone thinks of Christ as a literal door swinging on its hinges. Jesus is not an inanimate object. He is God eternal. But after we recognize that Jesus is speaking metaphorically, we also have to appreciate its significant meaning, its great, true, real meaning. Nothing else but saying, eating my flesh and drinking my blood communicates as vividly how we really receive from Christ what he has given to us. So to really experience his saving power, we learn that we have to feed on him and him alone. That we must absorb his teaching, his character, his mind, his ways. We must take in for ourselves the virtue that is in him till his mind becomes our mind and his ways become our ways. You know, that, that's what we call sanctification. To take on the mind of Christ and be transformed into the likeness of Christ. And that's my point, that we are conformed to the likeness of that which we feed upon. Whether it's the image of the invisible God, whose name is Jesus, or that of the so-called ruler of this world, or the ways of this world, we are what we eat. So first I want to stress that the, that the flesh of Christ is real food. Spiritual food. Think of a man shut up in a dungeon and deprived of food. His existence is drawn out in pain over days, weeks, and ultimately, that person will die. And so it is with us unless Christ is our daily food. And we see that throughout the scriptures. We see that in Jesus' prayer to us. We see it how God taught the people in the, uh, with the manna in the desert daily that unless Jesus is the meat that we eat, we will turn to whatever this world has to offer. And what the world has to offer will cause us to decay. It will destroy ourselves. 
If we turn to images of lust, we become slaves of desire and are mastered by the Lord with what we think we can control. We can't. If we surround ourselves with hateful voices, pop culture voices, media voices, political voices, they're bound to grow hate within ourselves. But if we immerse ourselves in the one who came full of grace and truth, we will live graciously and we will live truthfully. We need to understand the significance of these words. You know, many in the church are babes in grace. They can be at all ages, but still can be babes in grace. But as real food, Christ's flesh helps us grow to maturity. The word of God, the truth of God, the work of Christ. And so we, we mustn't be content with we faith or dim hope or a spark of love. If we want to become perfect, pursue that. We can't in this life, but we are still called to grow more and more into the likeness of Christ. But we can only grow as we increase in our knowledge of him and in our submission to his Holy Spirit the indwelling of the spirit. So it causes growth, food causes growth, but food not only causes growth, it also makes up for the, the wear and tear of our bones and muscles and skin. And the real food of Christ repairs damage too. You hear the psalmist declare, he restores my soul. Think about all the ways that that happens. He, he makes up for the waste of temptation and, for the pain and pressure of heartache, for the fret of trouble, for the fume of anxieties, for everything that gnaws at us. He's the one who repairs the damage. He's constantly working in us. Charles Spurgeon, Prince of Preachers, once said, Oh, believer, you will soon degenerate. This world of sin will soon make you backslide and lose every good thing you have unless you go to Christ and continually feed on him. By feeding on him, the world shall not hurt you. Temptation shall not wound you. Your trials shall not overwhelm you, for you shall find his flesh to be meat indeed, and they that feed upon him shall still bring forth fruit in old age. Their last days shall be their best days, Instead of declining, they shall gather strength with multiplying years till the moment when heart and flesh shall fail. But then, then shall the strength of their souls and their portion forever be most fully revealed in them. But this is not all there is. Jesus points in our passage, the last day, the life eternal. Jesus knew what he was doing when he called his flesh real food. Food helps us to do so much that we cannot do on our own. You know, we don't just have the right kind of diet to, to lose weight or to look better. It helps the, the sick by removing pain, maybe even disease, cleansing the body, strengthening. And this is certainly the case of believers in Christ. The pains of conviction, the throbbing of a guilty conscience, they're stilled when one receives Christ in their inmost parts. If a person is sick with worldliness, with doubt, with pride, with envy, just let them have a hearty feast on the flesh of Christ. That spiritual disease cannot linger so, Christ, though, is not the only kind of soul food, pardon the expression. There are many sorts of soul food. Some people feed their souls on their work. A lot of people do that. They say, you know, I've done well, but sometimes it's not even what we call secular work, and there is no such thing for the Christian. But there's other kinds of works that we don't typically think of. We've prayed, we've fasted, we've given to the poor, we've been very effective in our programs. And their soul feeds on that, but really it's just wind. It's like feeding on the air. But if they've truly trusted Christ, that 
what they would know as the real food. Others feed on ceremonies. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I love many of the traditions of the church, but these aren't the real food either. They point to the real food. They point to Christ. Christ received in the soul. Christ trusted for salvation. That's meat indeed. That when a person can say, my hope is in the crucified alone. My hope is in the resurrection alone. That I look every day to him. That my meditations are for him. My reading is about him. My prayers are all sent to heaven through him. My praises are for him. That he is my soul's joy and comfort and strength and help. That, that's what it means to be holy. It's not about us. It's about the one we receive and who he is. So I hope I, hope I made it clear that, that it's in receiving Jesus, trusting in Christ. That is the eating, Jesus himself being the food. Augustine summed it up way, well, I think, said this way, believe, believe, and you have eaten. Believe, and you have eaten. The faith is the only way to eat the flesh of Christ. Faith is the mouth and the stomach of the soul, and Christ is the only right kind of food for it. Everything else is junk food. If it's not the truth, then it's toxic. It's very different than the world's philosophy. So I need, I need to say something about how, how Christ's blood is real drink. There are some things about what drink does for the body, just as Christ's blood does for the soul. One, it refreshes. It refreshes us. As a weary traveler on a hot burning day refreshes by washing the, the face in a cool stream, the blood of Christ refreshes the one who trusts in him. Knowing that Jesus did what he did for me, that's what revives the soul more than anything. And also, drink cleanses the body. It flushes out the junk. And when you get Jesus into your soul, he, he purifies the spiritual veins. He did so through his Holy Spirit. He removes those impurities from our spiritual system. He is the one who makes us new. And so the more we rest in the crucified Christ, the more you will rid yourself of those clotting and corroding sins because you're trusting in Jesus. For we overcome, not by our own efforts, but through the blood of the Lamb. The word of the testimony of Jesus. So yes, yes, the blood of Christ is real drink. It's spiritual drink. But again, there are wrong kinds of spiritual drink, like there are wrong kinds of spiritual food. Some people drink and till they're drenched with earthly pleasures. There's all forms of that. I wonder what comes to our minds. Others drink until they're full of their own selves, their own self-righteousness. The thing is, our enemy has all kinds of cups he likes to offer us. He knows how and with what to fill them. It could be greed or bitterness or strife. And they don't sound appealing, but he has a way to make them sparkle to the eye that they never satisfy. But, but if your soul can get the precious blood of Jesus Christ, then you can rejoice that Jesus died for you. You can drink and get a satisfaction that nothing can destroy. So drink, thirsty soul, drink, drink. You need pardon? You have it in Christ. You want life? You have it in Christ. You want peace, comfort. You have it in Christ. You know, no key ever fit a lock as well as Christ fits a sinner. And thankfully, it fits for every one of us. That hole inside made Christ necessary. That hole inside was actually made for Ponder that. We're going to fill it with something. Don't let it be filled with something else. Because when you fill yourself with something else, it's still not full. It's still hollow. 
Because when you fill yourself with Jesus Christ, you'll never be the same again. Because what you fill yourself with determines who you will become. You are what you eat. So let's consider that as we kind of wrap things up. You know, what the nutritional information on a package, maybe some of the sermons kind of sounded like that. And that's important, but what's most important about the food? Not reading about the food, not looking at pictures about the food, but eating the food. That's what we need to do. We need to eat it. You don't buy food just to read the label. You eat it. You enjoy it. And so there is just as strong a need for a real, real reception of Jesus Christ. And what if you took some food to a hungry person and held it in front of them and said, there, don't you feel better? Look at it. Don't you feel better? I don't think that would turn out very well. Come on, look at it, sir. Don't you feel better? No, I feel more hungry. You're messing with me. Get out of here. I want to get it between my teeth or it's useless. Likewise, what use is it if we come and listen Sunday after Sunday but never decisively act, never trust Christ in our lives? And though through sermons and parts of worship you may hear Jesus pour out his grace and his truth and his life, but do you drink? Do you drink? People aren't satisfied with seeing gold. They want to take it home. How is it then that some people are content with hearing about Christ, even talking about Christ, but don't seek to develop deep faith, don't seek to strengthen their union with the Lord? Why don't they take him home? Why don't they receive him? How much do you desire him? I think that's, we don't want to, get lost in the metaphor that we miss the whole point. And if you've received Christ as the desire of your heart, if you do partake of him, you know, how, how are you showing your gratitude? How is that displayed in your life? If Jesus is truly real food and real drink, then we have great reason to give thanks. Great reason. You know, if we sit down at meals and we take time to give thanks for what is the so-called ordinary provision, then Whenever we come to feed upon Christ, whenever we think upon Him, whenever we reaffirm our dependence on Him and believe again, we should give even greater thanks. Because the true spirit of a Christ follower is perpetual thanksgiving. Because we're to feed on Christ at all times. I'll kind of wrap up with this. In, in ancient times, we still hear it today. They call the Lord's Supper Eucharist. Does anyone know what Eucharist means? Giving thanks. Giving of thanks. And so let our lives be a, a continual Eucharist. As we feed on Jesus continually, let us lift up in praise. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And even though it is indescribable, we should still find ways to not keep silent continue to proclaim because if Jesus is the bread of heaven, real food and real drink, then we should be eager to tell others about him, to hand him out. Brothers and sisters, as his flesh is meat indeed and his blood drink indeed, let us hand out Jesus to those who are starving, to those who are parched, that they may be full and be satisfied. for granted what you have given not only 2,000 years ago not only on the cross of Calvary but that we are able to receive you to be nourished by you every day and so Lord may we those who have no life no satisfaction 
continue to hunger and thirst for you, to run after you, to be filled by you for your glory, for your kingdom. We pray. we have received and we continue to receive. So let us respond as we give back through our tithes and offerings. continue to feed our faith upon you so that we can praise your name and word and life. Use these gifts to accomplish that. We pray this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We come to a time where we can pray for one another. We want to ask first, are there joys that you would like to share? We've got Mary in the back. I can bring a microphone to you. Sharon. Thanking everybody for their prayers. I did great. Poor Bud. still. I still can't lift. If I could lift, I'd feel a whole lot better. Got a lot of cat boxes I gotta do. So, uh, but anyhow, but is doing them, so he's doing fine. But thank you, everybody. I did fine. So, we're glad to hear it. We'll continue to pray. I, is that Francis? Okay. Well, I guess this is a happy occasion. Carol and I are celebrating our 60th, 8th wedding anniversary oh. today. Oh. Oh. Wonder. <laughs> We have Barb. Mary, we have Barb. Barb. So I want to um, celebrate the, um, the growing number of 
youth that are showing interest in going to Columbia in, um, next year. We're now up to six. So with that, um, is such a celebration, um, but then there's also the, um, the need. So um, as you know, we just wanna support, support our youth who expressed an interest in, in going, and um, I'll let you know more as we go, but please um, just think about ways that you can support with your prayers and with your financial support. Thank you. Yes, that's right. We are, we, we are so excited. We are so excited for what God's doing, moving in hearts and the opportunity to have youth go. I can't, it's great. can't wait. Uh, Sherry. Um, so Missy is making wonderful steps in her progress, and physical therapy is really paying off. She still has a long road ahead of her but she's doing so well, and it's just such a blessing to see her improve and hear about her improvements, and just please keep um, Barb and Michael in your prayers as they continue to care for both Missy and Brody, and again, it's just, she's doing so well, and we just are so thankful for what God is doing and for who he is, and that we know that he is capable, more than capable, Other joys, celebrations, thanksgivings. Concerns, we have concerns. All right. Well, let's pray. Yeah, absolutely. There's your own Palestine. Yeah. All right. Well, let's pray. Lord, we come before you, and we thank you that you are almighty God, that you are sovereign and good and faithful, and you are working in ways we can't see or understand. Lord, we come before those who are facing atrocity, war, devastation, hatred, Lord, the loss of life, the loss of home, of family. Lord, we pray. We pray for Israelites. We pray for Palestinians. We pray for those in the midst of war and danger. We pray for peace. Lord, we pray for those who've lost loved ones, who've lost children. For those who are plagued by nightmare, who continue to carry unspeakable loss. Lord, we pray that you provide in every way, emotionally, spiritually, physically, relationally. Lord, we pray for those on the front lines, those who are responding, that you give them wisdom and compassion to offer hope and life. Lord, I pray that you, through your people, will bring light where there is darkness, to bring your life. And Holy Spirit, move in, in ways that only you can. Lord, we call upon you, we need you to redeem and restore Lord, show us how we can be a people of prayer and a people of action. Lord, where there is need, Lord, show us how we can respond with your love and testify to it. Lord, we give you praise and thanks for the ways that you continue to work amidst us, that you do renew our strength. And so may we continue to feed upon you that we may be nourished by your word and your truth, your love and your grace, day after day, continually coming before you, knowing that you are the one who renews us and sustains us every moment, every breath. 
And so we give you praise for that. And we thank you that we have been set free from sin and death through Jesus. We thank you for the life that we have and the life we can now live for you. And so we praise you for the ways we have spoken of that, testified to it this morning. And Lord, we pray as we continue to, to testify to your work, that we continue to trust in you for the days ahead and the lives lifted up, spoken of, for those on our hearts, those down the streets, those a world away. Lord, show us how we can be those who can lift high the wonder who is Jesus. Lord, we thank you that this is not all there is. And may we live with eternal hope. May that guide our actions and our lives. And may others come to know that wonderful hope that we have. Lord, minister to the hurting, to the grieving, as only you can. And we, we continue to proclaim your wonders. And we pray all these things in the name of our Savior Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. <coughs> Church, let us stand and sing there is a fountain.
We want to thank you for worshiping with us today. We hope you'll join us for fellowship, following worship in our gym. For those who've worshiped with us virtually, uh, we pray the Lord's blessing uh, upon you as well. If you have a need of prayer, if you want to know more about Jesus, the bread of heaven, and this call to continually be nourished by him, we'd be overjoyed to talk with you and to pray with you and to join with you in that. And so now hear this benediction, this charge, Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 20. And this, Paul speaks of himself, and we proclaim it to the church. You have been crucified with Christ, and you no longer live, but Christ lives in you. The life you now live in the body, you live by faith in the Son of God, who loved you and gave himself for you. Amen. Mm -hmm.